position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And hello and welcome into Views from the Sideline. That's Molly Hill. I'm Joey Tysick, and March Madness has begun. We saw some madness. We saw some March. Uh, Listen, um, I, I picked with my heart on my big one, and it actually worked. Yeah. For a game, at least. Uh, my bracket where I thought about everything lost on day one, and my bracket that I thought was going to be like the one that I picked with my heart came very close to being really good, but I missed out on a lot of stuff. And funnily enough, I believe I only have two teams left in that bracket. (laughs) I have Illinois and Iowa state, but those are, or no, I have Iowa state and Tennessee and that's my final. So that's my championship matchup. Everybody's brackets are trash. I I had UConn in Florida. I mean, UConn and Duke, that's what we came down to in the, yeah. Yeah. So I had Kentucky, funny, um, and Iowa State. So that one's still going, but it's a very outside shot of winning in my family bracket. I only put it in the podcast bracket, <laughs> yeah. so that's the only one I have going. Um, did you make any bets at all? I did not. Okay. I put in a lot of big bets, or like big leg parlays, um, but I only did like dollar bets like I've been doing. Um, came close on a $900 payout, um, but everything else... Pretty much lost, and I made a bet on Saturday or something, and basically got my money back. So I went even, which is fine. Yeah, I I should have took one of the Jack Golke specials they had <laughs> yeah. on Saturday, which half of them hit. Mm-hmm. I could have took like Jack Golke six threes, and it would have hit. Yeah. So I my belief wasn't deep enough. I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> well, before we get deeper into the NCAA tournament. Um, and previewing the Sweet 16. Um, we need to do a wrap-up on our two teams. Uh, Michigan State, unfortunately, lost. They did make it to the second round, lost to North Carolina. Um, Those they, first five minutes, they looked like the Globetrotters or something. Yeah. They, or the Monstars. I thought I had something cooking, because remember on the podcast when I said I felt like they, they had a chance? And they technically had a chance, but uh, they I don't know what happened in the second half. They just... Looked terrible all of a sudden again and uh, couldn't get it done. Um, Listen, uh, I was riding with a friend to another friend's house to watch the games. Mm -hmm. And we were listening to the radio broadcast. And when I tell you I was just confused and pretty, like, just mad (laughs) (laughs) listening to it. Yeah. Just, like, every five seconds was like, UNC turnover, UNC miss, MSU make. And it was, I was like, what is happening? Mm Mm-hmm. And then I heard Matty Sissoko made a post move and scored over Armando Bay. I was like, what What universe yeah, it was getting are wild. we living in? Mm-hmm. It, was, yeah, it was crazy. But they came back down to earth. Um, in the first round, they beat Mississippi State actually pretty handily. I thought it was going to be a little tougher. Um, but they looked pretty clean the entire game and uh, had a big win. Made it to the second round, like I said. And uh, that ended there. And their season of being a top five preseason team to – second round exit in the tournament definitely goes down as one of the biggest disappointments in recent memory um i don't know there so i want to pick your brain about it because i think it's more interesting from an outside perspective because michigan state fans are all over the place right now um and i don't know how to feel about it um some are super optimistic still somehow some way um and then other others are a little bit closer to me of gloom and doom um i do think there's there's some hope, but what did you think about the the whole talk with Tom Izzo about how he says he needs to do better, he needs to make a change, talking about next season? A lot of people think that means he's entering the transfer portal and that he's going to change his ways completely. I'm more skeptical, and again, that's probably because I'm a big hater right now, but do you believe that or at all? Like, Do you think he's actually going to fundamentally change his ways, or do you think it's more of like a end of the season 
I don't know, pitch for next year? I think at this point, it, it's it's impossible for Tom Izzo to completely change who he is. He, in all honesty, he doesn't want to change who he is. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm I was gonna ask you about the big quote everybody's been reacting about in the post game presser, where he said, "I'm gonna make another run in this tournament or die trying." Yeah. He wants to do it his way. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to. He wants to prove people what, wrong. Yeah, he he doesn't want to do what everybody else has done and make the big adjustments to what old coaches hate about what college basketball has become. Mm-hmm. What Rick Pitino said a few weeks ago where he said, I still love college basketball, but what it's become, it's not for, like, coaches of my time. Yeah. And I, I fully believe Tom Izzo wants to make that one more run. Mm-hmm. But is he going to dive head first into the portal? Right. Is he going to, like, hit the – I, I I don't see him hitting the road and like going after big time recruits and like changing his philosophy. Mm-hmm. He he might make little changes. He might do like the Tyson Walker route again and the Joey Hauser. Mm-hmm. Let's get a few guys to fill some holes. But I I, I don't see any way it's where funny. he makes this crazy turnaround. Right. It's funny that you mentioned that though because the thing that I've started to realize too, and other people are saying it, but like. The best MSU players of recent memory are transfers. Are Tyson Walker and Joey Hauser, <laughs> yes. who you just mentioned. Yes. So it's like apparently he's doing a good job when he gets these transfers. He just he doesn't go out and do it very often. Um my other problem, and I'm not gonna try to rant too much about all this stuff, but like the big thing lately has been how people are talking about transfer portal sucks, NIL sucks, I don't want to coach because it's not the same as it used to be. To me, it's like almost like a happy medium, though, because there was a while where we were getting so many one and done players, which goes into Coach uh, Calipari yeah, we'll and Kentucky. <laughs> but um, like there were so many one and done teams, and those one and done teams never amounted to anything except for what was it, twenty twelve Kentucky, and I, you could say uh, twenty fifteen Duke, the Jalil Okafor team that won okay, the national championship. Yeah. But yeah, there's also the. Uh, Coach K was against it, mm-hmm. decided to go into it, but yeah. he had a balance where he had like Quinn Cook right. and other older guys with Jaleel Okafor yeah. and the younger. He had a mix where it all made sense. Right. And so people are complaining about, oh, we don't get the same player for four years because of the transfer portal. But you're also keeping more players because of NIL now. So all those guys that are just not quite good enough, but they help a college team. They're sticking around because of NIL. So you're getting more of those players so you get to know them. Now, if your team underperforms, those guys can transfer out, and that's what hurts it. But I think people are getting a little too concentrated on the transfer portal and things. That Yes, it, it does affect things, but like there are certain scenarios where you can build a program and keep guys for four years now because of the money, um, and that's helpful. Like I think that's partially why Oakland did pretty well this year. Um, I think there's some, uh, there's a little bit of a balance there for that. Like you're, you don't have to get these one and done teams anymore. Um, you can keep players around because of NIL, and if if those coaches are still having problems with it, go to a mid major and coach there, because you'll get guys that'll stay for four years. Build a program that way. Yeah, I. This is might not be like the most clean equivalent, but there's a thing with college football that I say where. If you want to be one of the top programs in the country, you need five-star recruits, four-star recruits, high-level athletes, guys that you can mold into high-level football players. But you also need program guys. Mm -hmm. Guys that you recruit, the three-star guys, that can play, can be developed to play at a high level, Mm -hmm. but you know will stay at your university for four years. You You need college players. Yes. You need both in a mix to be able to hit the highest level and stay at that consistent level Mm -hmm. in both football and college basketball. Yeah. Can Michigan State do it? Maybe we thought this would be the year where it would mix. Mm-hmm. But it all came back to I think we both have comments on this. I've seen a lot of like extra optimism with MSU fans going into the next season. Yeah. And I can't get mad at people being optimistic. Mm-hmm. That's what you want to be as a fan. Right. Especially as a Michigan State basketball fan. But there's a few things where I've seen, especially one tweet. <laughs> I saw a Cohen Carr 30-second highlight clip Mm -hmm. that a Michigan State fan account put together on Twitter. And 
what he said in the tweet was, can't wait to see what happens next year when he goes through the, through the development program over the summer and he turns into a monster next year. Mm-hmm. Isn't the development program like the biggest problem with Michigan State right yeah. now? Yeah. None of these do. Malik Hall, mm-hmm. who had a good season. Right. A.J. Hoggard. You can go down the list of guys. Mm-hmm. The development over three and four years has been little to non-existent over the last three, four years. Yeah. And, so, we, and we know that especially because we keep getting guys like Matty Sissoko. He's raw, but he's got a lot of hidden talent He there. was a borderline five-star recruit right. coming out of high school. Colin Carr, hyper-athletic, crazy upside, but he's raw. Even Xavier Booker, highly ranked recruit. A lot of upside because of his size and his length and his ability to move with the ball. Very raw player. None of those have been developed. So, like, there needs to be more emphasis. Like, I think Michigan State has gotten away too much of thinking we can turn this guy around. It's like it's like that uh, the toxic masculinity of, oh, I can I can save her. I can help her. <laughs> Or just toxic yeah. relationships where, oh, I can save him. I can make him better. I can make her better. Like, that's what it's like. Like, oh, this player has a lot of potential, but we have to develop them. We need to make a little bit more of a mix. Let's get some recruits that are just proven guys. Why doesn't Michigan State have Purdue's roster? I don't know. Braden Smith came in and immediately was a top three Big Ten point guard. Mm-hmm. Fletcher Lawyer was from Michigan. Yeah. You got guys that are from the Midwest. Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, you got guys, mostly Midwest kids, mm-hmm. that Matt Painter brings into Purdue. And even if they don't blow up in one year, by year two and three, you know exactly what's going to – they're either going to be all-conference or they're going to be contributing at a high level. Right. It seems like that's what Michigan State used to be. Mm-hmm. Why can't they be what Purdue is right now? I, I don't understand. That's a good point. We don't need to be going out. All the way to the West Coast, picking up guys, and I mean it's fine. Yeah, Cohen Carr is from South Carolina, I believe. Right. Great. Yeah. He has like a fifty-inch vertical, jumps out of the planet, mm-hmm. insane dunks. But he's no perimeter game. He still needs help on defense. Like, there's still a lot yeah. there that needs to get figured out. I, I I brought up I think a few weeks ago when Iowa beat Michigan State, they got a freshman big man averaging ten and seven, mm-hmm. and it doesn't look hard for him in the Big Ten. Right. He was a big reason why they beat Michigan State and had an okay season. Mm-hmm. Why can't Michigan State find a decent Midwestern big right. that can just come in and is comfortable mm-hmm. like Iowa can? Yeah. I, I, yeah it, it doesn't make much sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot to go. And like like we said, we could rant for forever about it. But disappointing season. Hoping for better next season. But I feel like we've been saying that for a while. So... I do think, like, this year, though, I definitely saw a lot of turn where finally people are starting to see it the more, like, the way that I've been kind of talking about. And, again, like, I like being right, but I also hate being right sometimes. And people are finally starting to realize, like, Izzo is struggling right now. Does that take away from his tenure? No. But... At some point as a program, you have to realize maybe this guy's not right for us anymore. And I'm not saying that that's where they're at right now, but it's just something to start thinking about because next year I think is like the biggest year for Tom Izzo because he needs to do something. There there are still tons of Michigan State fans that I've seen saying the team let Izzo down. Yeah. That that shows you how. I've seen yeah. that a lot too. I've also seen the excuse of the assistant coaches and stuff that he I mean that is a problem. He yes. does not have a high level assistant coaching staff. But part of the process of bringing in assistants is you talk to Tom about who you want yeah. in. So you got to he's got to take a little bit of blame or people have to give him a little bit of blame. I I think he does take some of the blame, but people have to realize Tom Izzo is part of the problem. He's not the whole problem. But he is part of the problem. So, big year next year. Still exciting, though. There, There is a lot of hope. Jeremy fears if he can get healthy, if he can turn out to be something like he is and actually develop, he could be good. But I think he has more innate talent ahead of those other guys yeah. that we've already seen. So, should be exciting. Michigan. Fire Juwan Howard, like we said. 
they found their new head coach already. Malik, how do you feel about it? I'm happy. If it wasn't Nate Oates, if it wasn't some other big name that See, was, had an incredible pedigree. I hate to cut you off already. Um, I was surprised that Nate Oates was in the running. I don't know if you heard that from... After he took the extension from Alabama, I, yeah. Yeah, I had an idea he wasn't coming. Okay. That was like the dream, though. Okay, I got you. But for I'm almost like the past year and a half or so, I've been saying, if not certain coach called Dusty May. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Ward Manuel actually didn't take much time in getting it done. Yeah. They did. They wasted no time. They found who they wanted. A guy that can build a program took FAU from pretty much nothing. We've never heard of a like high level Florida Atlantic basketball team. Yep. Got the right collection of talent in the right system and got them to a final four last year. Got them back to the tournament this year with a ton of hype. Didn't live up to all the hype. Right. But most mid-major programs never live up to like the returning Sweet 16 Elite 8 Final Four runs that they've made. Mm-hmm. He got them back to the tournament. They lost in the first round. They kind of lost some mojo. It happens. But this is the kind of coach I'm on board with. He has the potential to bring over a few players that he had from Florida Atlantic. In his press conference, he's already said, He's going to be like modern to the point of frustrating some fans hmm. because they're going to shoot a lot of threes. <laughs> he's going to attack the portal. He's going to attack the recruiting trail. Hmm. He's already called Trey McKinney, hmm. who's one of the top players in the country from the state of Michigan yeah. in next year's class. He's going to do what top program fans want. Mm-hmm. Coach at a high level and go get high level players that fit what you do. Yeah. Now, obviously, we're going to see have to see what it all looks like we have no idea what the roster is going to look like. Right. But for you, from an outside looking in standpoint, this is a guy that I had on my, on my list. Most, like the number two for most of the time. I like what he did at his last job, and I think he could do really well mm-hmm. at Michigan. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's exciting at least. Um, obviously, Jawan was just – something was wrong, uh, yeah. honestly. Now, there were reports that came out. I think about a week ago that Terrence Shannon, Caleb Love, and one other player were all supposed to commit as transfers to Michigan. Hmm. But whether it was like grade problems, them not being being able to get in because of grades or NIL stuff, mm-hmm. those two and another guy ended up not coming to Michigan. And there were people like, well, what would have happened if Juwan would have got those guys and they could have had a great year? I'm I'm not looking back. Yeah. And you never know how they work yeah. with that team. He coached the guys he recruited, mm. and it went horribly wrong. Right. That's what we know. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it, it should be exciting. Um, A new chapter for Michigan basketball after being one of their worst performances this Arguably year. Arguably the worst season, top three worst seasons in Michigan basketball history. Yeah. What just happened. Right. So hopefully they can get back on track, be, I mean, even if they hit middle of the road of the Big Ten next year, will be an improvement. Yeah. All, all I want, I don't expect the John Beeline years. Mm-hmm. It would be amazing if we got back to that level of high-level consistency. I just want respectable basketball. Yeah. Be competitive in the Big Ten. Make the tournament most years. Mm-hmm. At least be competitive to make the tournament most years. Right. That type of stuff. Yeah. So, another wait and see, unfortunately, for these uh, two Michigan teams. The best Michigan team, I would say, for who, the tournament. Who would have known? Who would have known? Those Golden Grizzlies. We joked about it last week on the pod that, you know, there's a chance they could get it done. We thought that maybe, you know, Kentucky being so young could, you know, falter. We've seen it in the past with freshman teams. But the way that. Kentucky shoots, it was like, man, you're never safe because it just seems like any of those guys could go off at any time. Spoiler alert, none of them did. Um, And Oakland went nuts, and they were so close to being the Cinderella of this entire tournament. I think to be a Cinderella completely, I think you do have to make that Sweet 16 run. Um, But they were like a fan favorite for a little while here. Um. Is everything resolved with you and Coach Campy, officially? Not completely. 
<laughs> but okay, I, I have re- I have respect for him. Yeah, true respect for him. Now mm-hmm. he finally pulled off a win that gave a reason for people to talk about him. Yeah, being at a school for forty years is cool. Mm-hmm. But when you've made the tournament like less than five or six times, and when you've never won a game exactly. in the tournament, he finally showed. Why he deserved to be up there with some high level coaches, mm-hmm. and it was impressive. Now, a part of it was a uh, March legend emerging. Yeah, Jack Golke just going, just blacking out completely, mm-hmm. hitting ten out of twenty threes. Yeah, <laughs> just insane. Mm-hmm. And, and tough contested shots too. A lot of the time. Yeah. Now they there were a lot of times where they were late getting around screens and right. just and barely like got a hand in his face. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he he blacked out in that game. Yeah, the Rocket Watts played really well off the bench. DQ Cole missed. He hit all of his threes. He only mm. missed a few shots. He made a clutch one towards the end of the game. Yeah, too. and Trey Towns and everybody stepped up in the second half. Yeah, everybody. I mean, Black, Jack Golke only hit three threes in the second half. Right. So it was a real team effort to get it done. Yeah, they locked down on him a little bit in the second half. Yeah, cause Kentucky. They just they're young guys. Just they couldn't get it done. Yeah. And now, the, the defense was just as bad as it was all season. Yeah. And like a lot of people have pointed out, it's like Kentucky didn't do a scouting report that Oakland plays his own yeah. uh, because they didn't know how to deal with it for a while. Um, the only person that really did well for Kentucky was Antonio Reeves, which was kind of a surprise. He kept them in the game. Yeah. Oakland could have won free throws. Yeah. And Antonio Reeves kept yeah. Kentucky in the game because Oakland could have won by like 10. Yes. Yeah, the, the free throws were scary for yeah. Oakland, to be honest. Trey Townsend, what was he, like 7 to like 16 or something yeah. like that? Yeah. It wasn't good. Mm-hmm. A 80% free throw shooter. Yeah, so they, they all kind of struggled from the from the free throw line. Um, but they got it done. It was insane. Biggest upset of the first round, I would say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they got to play the other darling of the tournament, I would say, NC State. Who's now won like what eight games in a row or something like that? Uh, well, from the conference tournament, it's now six. Well, six, eight. It is eight. Okay, I was like, yeah. I know it's right around there somewhere. So. I'm wrong again. It's seven. <laughs> they is won five seven? games in five days in the ACC tournament. Yeah, and then two more. Okay, so, so they're seven. at seven now. I was, we were close. Yeah. Um, but in their March Madness, they went to beat Duke, North Carolina. Um, their first round they played. Um. Who did they play? Texas Tech. Yes. Um, beat Texas Tech, who was pretty good this year again. And then they got to play Oakland, which that was a fun game as well. NC State versus Oakland. Oh, I don't know how to put it, but Oakland definitely had a chance. They had a put they had a chance to hit a game winning shot. Yeah. At the end of the second half. And a bad call. Yeah, a led flurry to, of bad things happened. Yeah. Um like it, giving the ball to Chris Conway to make the yeah pass to the post, it just it didn't make sense. Yeah, so for me, I've said it. I've, I'm pretty sure I've said it before multiple times. My biggest pet peeve in basketball is not getting a shot up as end as the regulation ends. Um, a lot of the times you see people throw full court passes for like the Christian Leitner type shot. Honestly, this day and age, I'd rather somebody shoot a half court shot um, because you're more likely to get a shot off and. The worst part, too, about this was Oakland had a half-court set. They were in the the half-court. Yeah. Um, they got to pass the ball in. They got the ball in, which is sometimes the hardest part. There was, what, 10 seconds left in the game clock? I can't even remember how much time was left. It was something around 10 seconds, so plenty of time to draw up a play. They pass it into Rocket yeah, Watts. Rocket gets it, holds it. Chris Conway comes up. He kind of dribbles. it to Chris Conway. Yeah. yeah. Rocket kind of stands there for a little bit. Seems like they're trying to get something to develop. They have goalkey run uh, under along the baseline. I, I think there was a screen. Yeah, that, that might have been what they wanted to, at first. Yeah, but it, it didn't come. And open. it seems like they would have sniffed it out. So I don't. The problem is it didn't seem like they had a second option on the play. Yeah. So like you said, Rocket kind of dribbles off to the left. Chris Conway pops up for some reason. Rocket gives it to Chris Conway, which I feel like is already a scary thing because the way that he came off and came up to the wall. Chris Conway had his back to the basket. Yeah. And at that point, there's only five seconds left or something like that. So to me, I was like, oh no, here we go. And now, when, just, he, when he passed it to Trey, I thought Trey was going to catch it. Yeah. But then he just throws a bad pass. 
Yeah. yeah. So uh, it was it was rough. Yeah. If he, Trey catches that pass, I think it's a good chance he might have hit that because he was on a roll. He was at that yeah. time. He he definitely closed really well for them. Um, but yeah, and then NC State had a look to even win the game in regulation. It bounced off the rim, <laughs> which is terrifying. Yeah. Um, even more. Um, so then they went into overtime. Oakland just could not hit a shot, and th- that's the thing about that's why I like to get the shot off at the end of regulation, give yourself a chance to win, because a lot of the times the underdog struggles in overtime. We see it a lot. Um, It's like they give everything for that final moment, and then if they don't get it, it seems like it's just demoralizing. Here was my problem with overtime. (laughs) Yeah. His shots aren't falling all game. He hit one shot to end the first half to keep them close. Mm -hmm. But Rocket Watts is your best playmaker. You take him out one minute into overtime, and you put in the player that's having the worst game of anybody you're playing, mm-hmm. Blake Lemon. Yeah. And for the next three minutes, he does nothing. Yeah. He's been bad on defense all game. He's mm-hmm. hit a few threes. But besides that, it's he, been... He missed a lot of clutch threes. Yes. He lo- missed a lot of good open looks. Missed a couple free throws even, I believe. You take out your best playmaker and you put in a guy that obviously has nothing going. Yeah. And for the next three minutes, NC State just completely takes over. Mm-hmm. I think from that point on, Oakland shot, shot like 0-4 from the field. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I I like Rocket for being able to ball handle and give yourself a, a shot at going to the rim. That's the biggest reason why I think they needed him. Yeah. But even he wasn't playing super well, in my opinion. Um, like I said, a lot of his shots weren't going. Yeah. It, my biggest problem in overtime was it didn't seem like they were drawing up plays for Trey Townsend. Because, guess, yeah. it, like, at that point... Again, we're we're at the point in overtime where it's like you don't want Jack Golke to to touch the ball. So that's he's kind of taken away, but you still try to draw up some plays for him. But then you sneak Trey as the second option, I think. And then the third option is let Rocket try to make something happen. But even then, like like we said like you said, Trey Townsend was huge down the stretch. He started hitting threes and he was hitting his jump hooks yeah. a little bit, and they just stopped going to him in overtime. And I don't I don't Listen, know what happened. This, this is the reason why I'm not all back in on Campy. <laughs> okay. I don't know if the lights got too bright. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he just got nervous, but I I don't I don't know. I I have no idea what happened. Mm-hmm. Once Blake came in, there were no good sets. Yeah, there was mostly just standing around and dribbling, and then a last second, I, nothing made sense anymore in the overtime. Yeah, and I I just don't understand what happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their offense went really stale. And yeah, it was it was tough. And then you know, I mean, you have to guard DJ Burns the entire game. That's a t- that's a tall task for anybody. Yeah. Uh, that man is a monster. Him and DJ Horn are just they're kind of on a heater. Mm-hmm. DJ Burns, especially his touch at the rim is just ridiculous. Yeah, he hit some tough jump hooks and floaters in that game. Yeah, especially as as hard as he goes on his spins and things like that. And he just it's just like softly put it. Yeah, Zach yeah, Randolph esque, like we said. It was fun to watch. Um, so unfortunately Oakland's run ends there. Um, the, the other sad thing is I, I believe it's official. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but that Trey Townsend is officially in the portal. I haven't seen an official okay. ruling yet. It's what everybody believes. Yeah. It, it might not be official. Maybe, maybe that's what I'm hearing is thoughts about it. Yeah, that he's checking, checking his account. Yeah. Haven't, haven't seen any. Okay. Anything official yet. But everybody believes. Assumes that that's yeah, what's going to happen. He'll be gone. Yeah, because apparently. They celebrated him during senior night. Yeah. <laughs> so. Apparently, um, his projected NIL could be 10 times what he's getting right now. He averaged 23 and 12 yeah. in those two games. Yeah. So, they said, I think there was an estimate of like $50,000 in NIL at Oakland. But if he moves to a Power 5 team. There could potentially be five hundred thousand, which would be a significant upgrade, uh, especially for somebody that I think is going to struggle to make it to the professional level, if not overseas for sure. He he would be a good overseas player easily, um, but getting to like the NBA could be a struggle for him. So to go play at a power five and maybe try to prove himself, prove me wrong, uh, would be pretty sweet to see. So, yeah. Um, Shouts out to get Gol- Jack Golke for getting every NIL deal. Yeah, got a TurboTax deal while yeah. he was playing in the tournament. And during the, before the NC State game, he got a Buffalo Wild Wings deal. Okay, it it's all 
it's yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, it, it, yeah, that's one of the cool things about NIL is they can they can pop out out of nowhere for a fifth year kid that transferred. From Five Hillsdale. years at Hillsdale, yeah. which I didn't even realize was in Michigan. I thought it was in Ohio. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize Hillsdale was in I Michigan. I mean, it's close to the border, but. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, any final thoughts on Oakland? Um, that one over have? Kentucky is an all-time program win. Yeah. Good job, Campy. Good job, the assistants, Mike Covington. Uh, the players stepped up big time in that game. Who would have thought this team would be the one to get Oakland's first tournament win? Listen. I, I could have swore the Kendrick Nunn team was going to be the ones. Yeah. But, listen, they're, that team, they're going to be legendary at Oakland mm -hmm. for a long time. They're going to celebrate this team Yeah, and how they beat Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a shame they couldn't make it to the Sweet 16, but, man, it, it was fun to watch. I know a lot of people around here rallied behind them. Um, always makes it exciting. So, Eastern, Western, Central, come on. Get it together. <laughs> Figure something out. How are you never good? Uh, and Ow. especially U of D. Listen, remember, remember when UAD used to be like a good college team? That was old. A <laughs> like while. old, Ray, old. That's listen, Ray McCallum. I was <laughs> yeah. like coming out of middle school. Yeah, when they were still good. Shouts out to Doug Anderson. Long time, time hops, but yeah. Good luck to any whoever takes that job. <laughs> right. Good luck. So, anyway, all right. Let's get into the rest of the teams. Um, do you have like a favorite game of the first round or first two rounds, first weekend? Honestly, I didn't like really pick it up until the second half. Mm -hmm. But that Colorado Florida game, yeah, that's that's definitely up there for it me. It ended one hundred two to one hundred. Mm -hmm. It was big shot after big shot in the last few minutes. Yeah, Walter Clayton hits a three to tie it. Colorado gets the ball. KJ Simpson hits a a jumper that hits the rim several times on the baseline. Yeah, goes in. Florida gets one more shot, misses it. Mm -hmm. It, it was everything you want in March Madness. Right. Just a back-and-forth crazy game in the tournament, mm -hmm. ending in the hundreds. Yeah. Uh, I think the Yale-Auburn was pretty fun, too. I, I was really surprised by Yale. Um, like I said, normally I'm I'm on for the Ivy League schools, yeah. but I just didn't. I didn't, I didn't have much they, confidence in them either. Yeah, I didn't think they had it in them this year. I felt like Auburn was playing really well down the stretch of the season, and uh, they just kind of fell apart, and Yale was able to take advantage, and that was a lot of fun. Um, I feel like there was a game on Saturday too. I'm I'm disappointed that Drake lost, and then his yeah, <laughs> Tucker DeVries' dad, who's the coach of Drake, took the West Virginia job, mm. and now Tucker DeVries is in the transfer portal. Oh, jeez! <laughs> so he's probably gonna be a Mountaineer next year. Yeah, Drake, shouts out to you mm -hmm. for your good run of three or four years. Yeah, Oregon Creighton was another good game, but I I missed it. It was late at night. It went into double overtime. Um. It stinks because that was a game that I called. I, I had Oregon winning that game, and they came up short. Um, similar to I had um, Grand Canyon making the Sweet 16. They came up short. Yeah. I had uh, Colorado in the Sweet 16. They came up short. Like, uh, it was so disappointing. I, I was so close on so many calls, um, which in point leads me to Marquette has been a big surprise for me. Tyler Kolick is fully healthy. I know they're the and number listen, two. That but... sweeping left hand like hook layup he does. Yeah. Nobody can block it. And mm -hmm. yeah, they're they're just in the zone right now. Yeah. Um Kansas shouldn't have made it out the first round. Sanford yeah. got it it it, it sucked. Mm -hmm. That block call was ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, the other one that I thought was really exciting um on Sunday. Did you watch Houston and AM? Um I don't think I watched a lot of it. Okay. So the game went into overtime, and oh my goodness, Texas A&M was given the opportunity like on a silver platter. Oh, when Texas A&M came back, I was yes. I was watching it. Yeah. I, I think I had two games on, so I wasn't paying like full attention, mm -hmm. but I saw Texas A&M was coming back. Yeah. So they made kind of a, a small little comeback. They were in the game most of the game, but they were able to get to the free throw line a ton. They, let's look it up. They shot 45 free throws. That's they, ridiculous. They were 29 of 45. Houston was 21 of 30. So a lot of free throws. Yeah. LJ Cryer fouled out real, pretty early uh, in the, the second half. Like, there was a lot of time still left. Um, who was the other one? Um, 
Javier Francis, he fouled out. Jamal Shedd fouled out. Yeah. And that was in overtime, I believe, that he fouled out. But Texas A&M was given so many opportunities. And then I know that he had a really good first round. Wade, Wade Taylor, Taylor stunk it up in that second. He period. looked bad. Yeah. Like, his shots were terrible. 5 of 26. Like, there would be 27 seconds left on the shot clock, and he would fire it from the logo. Yeah, screen comes up, one dribble pull. It, and I, it was, yeah. I know, like, they don't have a lot of three-point shooting, and he's kind of their main guy to get them back in. And he did hit a, a couple um, big ones because he was, like, 0 for for a while. Yeah. But I think he lost them the game. He went beyond hero ball. Yes. It was, it was completely different. It was ugly to watch. They end up losing by five because of it. And it was just, it was so disappointing for me because I, I did like a and um, I wasn't a huge believer in Houston, and that was, I think, their chance. Now I think Houston might have gotten a kick in the pants and they might, you know, be fine. Um, but yeah, the, the only, that, that's maybe my only problem is there were so many close upsets that just didn't happen. So we have a lot of the top teams making it through. Purdue blew out Utah State. Duke blew out James Madison. My two championship picks, UConn and Duke, both took care of business in the first two rounds. Yeah. Northwestern made a little bit of an effort at the end of the game, but it was, it was way too, too yeah, late was, at that point. Um, and then San Diego State blew out Yale, so it's just – Sunday was a little bit rough. Is Clemson the most surprising team? Yes, 100%. Okay. I counted them out so long ago. I thought, oh, you know, they beat New Mexico. Okay, I didn't watch them one – much of Clemson this year. Maybe I was just, you know, not paying attention. And then they just win again against Baylor, and I'm like, okay, who is Clemson? Yeah, listen, P.J. Hall fouled out with like 50 seconds left. Yeah. And Baylor had a shot to still win the game. Mm -hmm. And Clemson hit all their free throws yeah. and just closed them out. Mm -hmm. Really impressive. Right. Um, Kind of, yeah, like you said, they're like a big a big su surprise. Yeah, they, I think they hit 83% of their free throws, 20 of 24. And the biggest surprise that I had, because I didn't realize it, that they had Joe Girard on their team. Yeah. I did not know he chose he another orange team. Yeah. And I yeah. was like, wait a minute. Isn't that the guy that played for Syracuse? And then somebody on the call said, like, transfer from Syracuse. And I'm like, yeah. Wow. He just <laughs> traded orange teams. Okay. And he's not even their best. Chase Hunter is their best guard. Yeah. He played great. Right. But you at least have an experienced guard yeah. there, plus, you know, some younger guys that are better. Um, so yeah, that was pretty, pretty crazy. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to think about Clemson because now they're going to play Arizona, which I always feel like Arizona has been vulnerable. Um, I don't know. Do you, how do you see the sweet 16 going this weekend? I think Clemson has a small chance. Arizona is just, they're deep at almost every pos position. So it's one guy comes out, they got another guy coming in that can, Almost play just as well. Mm -hmm. They they like they need Caleb Love to play hero ball and have an off game. Yeah, because when he's on, they're almost like impossible to stop. Mm -hmm. Him and Kyle Boswell can both shoot the lights out. I think PJ Hall can give uh, Arizona's big some problems. Him and Ian Shiflin can both step out and hit threes, and they can score in the post. Chase Hunter can go back and, back and forth with at least one of Arizona's guards. I think mm -hmm. so. They have some chances, but. I think Clemson is like six, seven deep at most. Yeah. Like Arizona can go eight, nine guys mm -hmm. and not get in like a lot of foul trouble and not get that tired. So mm -hmm. yeah, they'll, they'll have to play a kind of clean game Yeah, to beat Arizona. It'll be tough. Yeah. So on just looking. Yeah. In the, in the sweet 16, the only double digit seed we have is NC state. Um, San Diego state and UConn. Do you think, San Diego State Listen, has a chance. Jaden Ledee has been a beast. Yeah, he's been really good. But I, I don't think they have what it takes to beat this this UConn team. <laughs> yeah, they are. It's, it's crazy watching them. Mm -hmm. They're like a well oiled machine. Yeah, and they just immediately get out to a lead. It seems like mm -hmm. they don't waste any time. Like you see, some of these teams kind of get out to a slow start and then pull away. UConn's just in yeah, control. They come out playing good offense and good defense, mm -hmm. and when they get up on you, they just choke you out. Yeah. Um, Alabama, North Carolina. I'm going Carolina. Yeah. I think I, Grand Canyon probably should have beaten Alabama. Probably. But, yeah. Mark Sears has been nuts. He's, he's, he's been legit. going crazy. 
Um, Speaking of Grand Canyon, have you seen the people talking about how suspicious their whole fan base and just so they're a nonprofit school, right? You see them on advertisements on like YouTube and stuff. Like, where do they get all these fans? Yeah, they like flew everybody out. I, I just lo- I just I, love I, the I, I just love the funny conspiracy about like where is all this coming from? Right. Yeah. It, it, Shouts out to Grand Canyon. It's interesting. They sound like a fake university, so it's yeah the antelopes. I get that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, North Carolina, though, I think still to me looks vulnerable as well. I, well. North Carolina puts their foot on the gas. I think only other like a few other teams can match them, mm-hmm. like UConn, Duke. What they're doing right now, it's only a few. Yeah. Um, and then the nightcap on Thursday, we got Illinois and Iowa State. Basically, offense versus defense. Yeah. Um, I need Iowa State to win. <laughs> I'm taking Iowa State. Do you? Yeah. I think Terrence Shannon and Mar- and uh, Marcus Domask are both very good. Mm-hmm. But outside of them, Iowa State might just like tell them two to just go off. Mm-hmm. We'll guard everybody else. You two just yeah try to beat us yourselves. Right. And that'll that could work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Iowa State had a little bit of a scare. Um, when was that? The second round yeah. against Iowa or it Washington was State. Like, well, it was kind of one of the least interesting games. Cause yeah. The second half, they just started choking Washington State out. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it just became a slow game. Right. Which is uh, what Iowa State is known for. Um, I think the most interesting match of this weekend is going to be NC State Marquette. Um, can NC State continue their winning streak, or is Marquette going to show you why they're a number two team? Um, I'm again. I'm hoping for NC State to keep it going because I just I I don't believe in Marquette. I don't know. Even though they've won their two games, I I still don't fully I, believe. I don't know who to take in this game. Yeah, like I take Tyler Kolick and Cam Jones mm-hmm. in the backcourt matchup, but DJ Horn is on fire. Yeah, Michael uh, O'Connell is playing well. Casey Marshall, they got like four guards that can all play. Mm-hmm. And then DJ Burns. Yeah. Like also Igadaro is like 6'9, 245. <laughs> right. And DJ Burns is just huge. Right. What is he gonna do? Mm-hmm. And they also have Hassan Diara. Yeah. Who fouled out against Oakland. Yeah. So yeah, Shock and Smart is gonna have to coach. I think he's a better coach than Kevin Keats. Mm. But NC State is just they're one of those teams that in March, they've just caught fire. Right. They're on that roll. Yeah. Uh, the other team that I think is surprising is Gonzaga. Listen, man. They're I, not the normal Gonzaga I'm sorry. team. I apologize. <laughs> I I completely doubted them because they didn't have a superstar. Yeah. Mark Few was just coaching them as a high-level team. Mm-hmm. Like, anybody can still. Graham E.K. is dominating. Their guards are just playing, like, clean ball. I like Ben Gregg. 33. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He can step out, hit the three. He's got a nice post game. I, I, I like Gonzaga a lot. I just, yeah. I didn't pay attention to him a lot because I just bought into St. Mary's, mm-hmm. and they lost in the first round. Yeah, I'm glad that I made the right call on the St. Mary's thing. But, um, and then Purdue, they're just doing. Have they made you believe yet? I mean, I, I haven't been one of the big haters. Yeah, <laughs> I said I, I expect them to make the Sweet 16. Mm-hmm. Now this will be the toughest matchup by far that they faced. Yeah, but they're. They're another team that's just kind of rolling. Mm-hmm. Like, they're hitting open shooters. Everybody's hitting their shots. Trey Kaufman is playing great in the post. It's not mm-hmm. just big Zach Eady. Yeah. Even though he's – Zach Eady has looked even better, that's I think. A, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'll I, take I, Purdue just because of that Zach Eady factor. Mm-hmm. And Braden Smith is, like, a top five-point guard in the country. Yeah. But Gonzaga's playing really good. But that should be a really good game. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that's I guess that's the only nice thing about not having too many Cinderellas is you get a lot of powerhouse teams yeah. playing each other, which I don't know. I, I go back and forth on which one I like more. I do like seeing the Cinderellas. There should be very few blowouts in these matchups. Right. Um, Duke Houston, another kind of fun one. Just because I took Duke to make the championship, I got yeah. I feel like I have to take them. Yeah. Like toughness and defense, Houston has the advantage. Mm-hmm. But offense wise, Jared McCain had 30 with nine minutes left in the second. Yeah. They could have, like, let Jared McCain go for over 40, mm-hmm. and they sat him. Right. The Tyrese Proctor is on. Mm-hmm. Kyle Filipowski is playing well. They, they're just – I like how they're playing. Yeah. I like it a lot. Right. And, I again, I think Houston's looking vulnerable again. Um, again, I think they could have gotten a kick in the pants, though, in this last game. But, um, it, I don't know, they – 
look like they could go down. And then the nightcap, of course, my my two teams that I need are both the nightcaps of both both nights. Um, and then Creighton, Tennessee, the nightcap for uh, Friday, uh, that could be a, a high flying, high scoring game. Um, I'll be in Tennessee during this game. Will you? So I'll probably be watching it with some friends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the thing that's that's spooky about Tennessee is Dalton Connect hasn't looked great necessarily. He's looked good, but for yeah. Tennessee to neither, really make that run, Tennessee and to, neither team looked very good in that last game. Yeah, Tennessee just happened to be the team that won. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Creighton's just got a few more options, I think, than Oregon, yeah. and that's what ultimately Tennessee helped shot twelve percent from the field. Last yeah, game. it was really ugly. They shot worse than Texas. Yeah, but. Tennessee went 15 of 18 from the free throw line. Texas only shot 12. Mm-hmm. Like that, that was just it was a an ugly bad game. game. Yeah, it really was. Most other scenarios, Tennessee probably loses, mm-hmm. but they hey, they made it. Yeah, I, I'm taking Creighton. I'm going with after that. What they pulled off against Oregon. Yeah, when they get to like hitting shots, mm-hmm. many teams can't catch up with them when they're just letting those threes fly. Yeah, and they start falling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're definitely uh, a tough team to deal with once they get into that into that rhythm. Um, is UConn still your favorite? Do you just think they're just far and away better than all the other teams, or do you do you think somebody has shown that they can compete? Like I've seen a lot of people do this. Would if you were to reseed, would you reseed the top four teams right now, like currently, or would all the number one teams still be your your four favorites? I'd st- I'd probably stick them okay. where they are. And yeah, UConn as the far favorite. Now I'm not I'm not trying to say nobody else has a chance. Mm. Like UConn could win in the final, could lose in the final four national championship. I'm hoping they lose to Iowa possible. State, to be honest. But <laughs> yeah, I, in terms of talent meets toughness mm-hmm. and defense and high level coaching, they have the overall package. Yeah. All righty. Well. I think that's it for the tournament. Um, unless there's something else you could think of that you needed to talk about. Should I should I give thoughts on the worst team in basketball like before we get to the big podcast at the end of the season? Yeah, because I told if, you pre show I if you if you want to get it out, I'm I'm all for it. How much time do we have? We got like ten minutes, so listen, man. Oh wait, wait, before you do that, okay. I do want to mention the NFL doesn't have a lot of stuff going on. There's some uh, little signings here and there. Not that I care about them. I think Cordero um, Patterson to the Pittsburgh is pretty interesting. Which is what I wanted to lead into. How do you feel about the new rules? The kickoff rules? I, I was going to say specifically the kickoff is the one I want to well, highlight okay, the, the most. The, hot, the hip drop tackle, I hate it. Yeah, that one I absolutely hate it. Disgusting. I don't know how you're supposed to tackle somebody from behind. Mm. Like, you can't. Grab somebody by the jersey from the back. I do you just like grab them by the shoulders at the right. top, or like grab them by the feet. Yeah, I guess those are the only two options. The other thing: what if you're trying to tackle Derrick Henry and he's just dragging you along, and it looks like a hip drop? I, I guess you, I guess you just gotta <laughs> you, know, you gotta try to grab him by the feet because um, you if you jump on the top of him, you're just gonna go for a ride. Mm-hmm. It listen, it makes it a disadvantage for so many. Yeah, so the NFL is banning the hip drop tackle. They are keeping uh, the tush push, and they are doing what? You can do a replay for um, uh, roughing the passer, and there's a couple other ones that you can actually use replay for, which I think is good. It might slow the game down a little bit, but it's good because there's been a lot of bad roughing the passer calls. Um, You also get a third challenge now if you got one correct which is a rule that dan campbell and the lions proposed which is funny um and then the biggest one that people are talking about right now is the new kickoff rule um so they're basically taking the what is it the xfl's um kickoff rule where nobody can move until the ball is received and the defensive team is what at the 35 yard line or something like that of the opponent and the receiving team their returner is at like the 20, 25 or something yeah, like that. He catches it, and then everybody starts moving. Yeah. I don't hate this. Mm-hmm. I think there's kind of some revisionist history with the reactions of people right now. Yeah. Because I remember when the XFL first announced it, mm-hmm. and when, when people first started watching it, 
most people were like, this is pretty cool. Like, right. This is safe. It's still very interesting. Yeah. Like the players are kind of closer together. So there still could be some hard hits, mm-hmm. but it keeps returns more interesting. Yeah. The only I've thing- seen mostly negative responses now that it's like, is it just yeah. because it's in the NFL now? Probably. I, I think that might be the only reason. Yeah, it could be. And, and the other thing that I could see happening is what we've already kind of been seeing lately. So a, t- a touchback now is moved to the 30, I think. I think. I think it's the 30 instead of the 25. So it's five yard difference. So some teams might take that into account. Um, but teams might just still kick it into the end zone. At first, I think they're going to do it and they're going to let people return, see what happens. But if you start, if if a team finds like a specific guy or you find a Devin Hester out there or I don't know, somehow you figure out some scheme that works. It can get ugly. And you can break it. Then teams are just going to kick it in the yeah. end zone every time. Like, could we possibly see somebody return like 10 kicks? Yeah. It's <laughs> one season in the future. Right. It could get strange. Yeah. So that's, I guess, my only grievance against it. But I'm all for for trying something. Um, so it, it should be fun. And that I guess that's all, all I'll say is like, I don't think teams are going to care about that extra five yards for a touchback. If if they're not giving up touchdown, return touchdowns, just kick it in the end zone. <laughs> And then we're going to be boring anyway and no returns. But yeah. hopefully we can get some sort of nice, happy medium. And that is I why Cordero Patterson just got signed to the Steelers. Is now teams are trying to find out, can these guys work? That's what Cordero Patterson was brought into the league to do, basically. He was a special teams guy originally. So can those guys come back and show out again? Exciting enough for the Lions. Khalif, they got guys like Khalif Raymond, Donovan Peoples-Jones. Yeah. Maybe Jamison Williams. That'd be pretty crazy. Um, so kind of fun. All right. Now you can rant about the worst team in basketball. Although they're technically not the worst team, right? I think they went back below the Wizards. I'm pretty Did sure. They? Okay. Yes. AKA we're speaking of the Pistons. Yes, they are below them. Yeah. They are below them. Okay. So you got like five minutes. I am reaching a point of apathy <laughs> with the Detroit Pistons. It's it's a mix of like depression and apathy. Mm-hmm. They've lost seven straight, by the way. I don't know where the bright spot is anymore. Yeah, we have four or five guys that, if you put in different uniforms, in my opinion, there would be some winning, some more wins, and some positivity. If you put Cade. Jaden Ivey, Jalen Dern, Asar Thompson, and Marcus Sasser in an Oklahoma City Thunder uniform. Mm. What do you think happens, Joey? <sighs> That's a tough question. Because with good coaching and a good organization, like, why is OKC? No, OKC shouldn't be winning this much to me. Yeah. It's a bunch of young dudes that are, aren't really proven outside of Shea. Mm-hmm. And they're the top seed in the West right now. Yeah. Like, my only rebuttal is, do you, I mean, there's definitely like some coaching issues, some development development issues, but I do think that there's a bit of a chemistry issue too. Like, I don't That's know. That's also probably a part of it. Like, if you just take this starting lineup and supplant it somewhere else, I don't know if it still works. Yeah, not, I'm also, I'm also, I'm not saying if you just literally like keep the same lineups. Yeah. Like. But if you just take the individual talents. If you put those five players on Orlando, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure they're still a playoff team with Paolo Bancaro. Okay. I think that they're still a playoff team. Yeah. Orlando has figured it out. Mm-hmm. Cleveland figured it out. Yeah. The Rockets, the godforsaken Houston Rockets. Jalen Green. We're not going to go deep into Jalen Green, and congratulations to him and his potential multiple children. He's losing his mind. I was saying his play on the court has been pretty good lately. But there's a, ever since that's happened, he's been losing his mind. I don't yeah, know if yeah. it's an exact correlation. Good for him. But even Houston has figured it out in some ways. Mm -hmm. And Detroit can't do anything right. Sengun is one of the best bigs in the league right now. Why do we... Why why is nothing good (laughs) in this organization? (laughs) From top to bottom, it seems like nothing... There's just a black cloud Mm -hmm. and nothing has gone right. Monty Williams got... To the Western Conference Finals with with a young Chris Paul. Yeah. 
and a bunch of role players. A young Monty Williams. Mm-hmm. He made it to the finals with Chris Paul again and Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton. Yeah. And he, he, got, he did very well in the West as a head coach. Oh, my goodness. Come to Detroit and it's nothing. Okay. It's all problems. Uh, again, I hate to interrupt, but so I'm looking at the Pistons stats and I don't think if another, I don't think another team has more players on their stat sheet. Look at this. I know they're traded and stuff, but it literally takes a full page. We'll have to save all that stuff for the deep dive when we have the state of the union for the Pistons. Oh my goodness. I never even even realized that. Holy moly. Looking at that, doesn't that make you just, how? Why is this happening? Oh, my boy Buddy's been getting in some games, though. How have we come to this? I don't know. And is how is it possible to get out? I Ooh. I don't I, I don't got, see the way. I, I got, don't see the way. I got some good ways out. <laughs> like with the owner we have, he's not going anywhere, I think. No. No. What Yeah, I mean What is the path? It's turmoil. I have a rough path out, but we'll we'll save it for another day, but it's not pretty. It's not pretty. That's I I just I feel like Cade Cunningham should leave probably. So that I want him to have a good career. So I'll, I'll and he spoil, is a very talented young player. I'll spoil a little bit. This team might have to restart completely. I feel like everything will have to restart. Again. Ev- literally everything. Yeah. <laughs> From the tip of the top to the bottom of the bottom. Mm-hmm. Everything has to change. Yeah. Honestly, I think we wouldn't be in the, this predicament if we had Victor. I know that's like kind of an that easy makes, way out, yeah. but that you that's probably would have helped. Mm-hmm. Victor would have helped. Paolo would have helped. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Like I said, if you put these those five guys I listed in Orlando in the some type of rotation, yeah. They're probably still a playoff team. Mm-hmm. With Jamal Mosley, who just came out of nowhere and is a pretty decent young coach. Mm-hmm. And Orlando, who has been a ter- terrible organization since Dwight Howard left, and all of a sudden just figured it out again. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Unsure. There's 10 games left. They're 12, just, 12 and 60. I Just get it over with. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to the draft. I'm not even looking forward to it. I haven't been looking to the draft all Free year. Free agency means nothing. Yeah. Are they going to overpay Tobias Harris? That's what it sounds is like. Is Gordon Hayward going to make like $20 million a year, Joey? <laughs> what is what is about to happen? Is I it going to get worse? Oh, it's, Is it possible? It's going to get worse. Maybe not in the win total, but it's just going to look worse. I think. Simone Fontecchio is the second best scorer on this team. Now, we agree that he's a good role player. But we've said it in the past. Jaden Ivey will give you 35 one night and then 10 for the next 10 games. Yeah. And you can't have guys like that as your second best scorers, unfortunately. As much as we like Fontecchio, that can't be your second best player on offense. We got to figure out when Chris can get on because yeah. it's going to be fun. This is it's going to be the most depressing, hilarious podcast I, of all time. I'm nervous that he's got a lot of positivity still left in his bank. <laughs> he, he probably does. All you right. know, we have the guys, Joey. We have the guys. Yeah, we have the guys. They're just not on the roster. If you have nothing around them, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, maybe Cooper Flag in 2029. Maybe. Nine. <laughs> Like his fourth year into the NBA. <laughs> Might take him a while. <laughs> maybe he stays at college. Uh, maybe my little brother in 2033. Okay. Sure. Maybe. <laughs> Can you play wing? Is he going to be a wing player? Uh, listen, he's a point guard. We might need anything. He's tall, but he's a point guard. Wait, by 2033, we might need anything. All righty. That is it for today. I'm sorry for ending on a depressing note. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, next week, maybe I'll try to go back through and find out more of the NFL stuff that we skipped over um, during the tournament. But um, we'll recap Sweet 16 and Elite 8, preview the Final Four, which is crazy, and the championship. And, uh, yeah, we'll go from there, and we'll keep talking about whatever we need to talk about. But 
That has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. Credits to Greg Campy. You got one. I'll keep it up.